Welcome to Book Reporter Talks To, where our in interview guest today is Taylor Jenkins Reid, whose book, Malibu Rising, was an instant New York Times bestseller, and it stayed there for nine weeks as we're doing this interview. And at today's show, Read with Jenna Book Club pick and a book reporter bets on selection. You know, we say the last, the, that last. <laughs> and for years, when I mentioned reading Daisy Jones and the Six, and I like Taylor's writing, people would immediately say to me, Carol, have you read The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo? So in anticipation of this interview, I did something that I rarely am able to do right now. I read something from a backlist because usually I'm only leading forward, but I'm really glad I did because there's trails and little, there are little breadcrumbs in this book that go through to the other two books. And there are lots of parallels. So this is a much longer than usual introduction, but welcome Taylor, it's so nice to have you here today. Thank you, thank you for having me. So years ago, I spent time with a friend in Malibu. She had family at home at land there since the late fifties. There are these two family homes and they had the original home on it and the bungalow and they had this grandfathered surf shack there. And I found myself thinking of that setting when I was reading Malibu Rising. So what drew you to be setting a book in Malibu? I mean, kind of the, the romantic house that you're talking about. I, I just, I love Malibu. I love being there. Uh, I love the ocean. I love the mountains. I love the fact that it's this beautiful area of the coastline where those two things, you know, come right up against each other. Uh, driving down PCH, seeing the homes and, you know, you've got a fish shack over here and a surf shack over there. It's just, um, it's a beautiful place physically and it has so much glamour and uh, just excitement to it that I thought, if I can convince myself that it's my job to go to Malibu in my mind, that feels like a really good way to spend some time. I think it's really good. I mean, I must go to the beach today. It's purely for research. There's no yeah, other reason right. I'm going. You get it. That's what I did. I'm going to go look at really cool houses today. And it's only because I'm trying to get a sense of place. I mean, there's no other reason for doing this today. That's exactly and, right. Yeah, that's exactly. And you know, the, uh, the opening line of the book, and actually this resonated with me because my friend said, this is something she thinks about all the time is fire in Malibu. Yeah. And yeah. she used to send her children out and go, I can smell it. Where is it? Let's go up in the hills, like where the coyotes are. Mm -hmm. And let's just go see what's going on. So the opening line is Malibu catches fire. It's simply what Malibu does from time to time. And the book closes talking about fire with the line, it had brought destruction, but it would also bring renewal rising from the ashes, the story of fire. So yeah. why roll this whole thing about this fire, the fire that's gonna happen at the house? Why fire? Yeah, well, I think one of the things is when you're talking about Malibu, fire becomes part of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, the beginning of the book where it talks about Malibu catching fire, I mean, that's, that's within the history of Malibu. It naturally catches fire um time and time again and so if we're in a place that is very easy to catch fire what does that mean about our relationship to that land malibu is an incredibly beautiful place it feels in in many ways to me it feels like a gift that mm -hmm. we've been given and we have to be careful with it because it can easily catch fire and so when we're talking about fire Immediately, what I start to think about is remove humans from fire. Fire becomes just a neutral thing, right? Fire is something that happens. And if you, if you start thinking about fire as a neutral force, you can start to see that it has both positive and negative things. Mm -hmm. when, you're, um, when something burns down, it is gone. It, it has been destroyed. And at the same time, you must now rebuild. Mm -hmm. And in the rebuilding, there is some beauty. Mm -hmm. And so I really liked bringing that idea to the book in terms of both fire and water in Malibu and how they're both neutral forces that are capable 
of incredible life affirming, life giving qualities, and at the same time, really destructive qualities. Yeah, and you know what's really crazy is you think about Malibu's on the water, like except for the part that's on the other side of the highway that's up in the hill, the part yeah. that's on the water, but you still think about fire there with the water right there is yeah. still such a constant dam at that you know yeah. danger, and. Yeah the metaphor of going back and forth between the two and look the about the book copy tells people what happens at the end of this book like yes. it's not like it's not hidden <laughs> yeah i mean i did a lot of preview events i mean i think i could recite that copy you know <laughs> but the way it happens folks is not yeah. what you think and there's so much going on at that party that could be it and the careless thing that happens really is well I, we're not giving anything away we can't because it's too much I love the character of Nina. She's strong, but I also found her to be super, super vulnerable at the same time. Did she come to you fully formed or did you start playing around with what her character was and what she was going to be? I knew from the outset that I really wanted to tell a story about a woman who could withstand anything and how that had come to feel less like a gift and more like a burden. If you can just withstand more and more and more every new thing that happens you learn to withstand it then you have no breaking point point. Mm -hmm. and a breaking point is one of those things where sometimes you need to be pushed up to your breaking point in order for things to change what if you have a woman who can her breaking point just seems to be further and further away whatever you dump on her she will keep handling it because i think so many of us and it's and it's a lot of women not not only women but there is no room to break mm -hmm. you have to just keep accepting and dealing with the situation and so i wanted a woman that i could really push to a breaking point who had never had that breaking point before mm -hmm. and what i love about nina and what developed over time for me was Okay, so now I know she can withstand anything. I know she's raised her siblings. She, her father has left her. She's lost her mother. She continues on. She no, she almost never shows any signs of, of you know, breaking. But the one thing that I got to add to her over the course of the story was, if she's famous and she has this public attention on her, what is that that's driving her to a breaking point as well. Mm -hmm. And that's where I came up with, you know, if she's a swimsuit model and in the line of somebody like Brooke Shields or Farrah Fawcett, or even now somebody like Emily Redakowski, mm -hmm. where she's known for what she looks like, she's known for her body, the way that we objectify those women, I wanted to give that extra piece to Nina that on top of everything else, she's also going to put a stop to or question whether she's capable of putting a stop to being objectified in that way as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And objectified while at the same time for years, she was doing that to make money, to take care right. of the family. And now right. it's like, well, wait a second, who am I and what do I want to be? Exactly. And that's what I really see by the end of the book. She's like, whoa, I think I got to take hold of this. And mm -hmm. I just love that. So there's, they're the rest of the Reva kids. We've got these two boys and a sister, two brothers and a sister. Was it always the four siblings? Did you always know it was four and why four? And tell us about them. Yeah, I love the Reva siblings. They were always four in my mind. And I liked the idea that it was Nina is the oldest and that she was taking care of the sort of motley crew of, of siblings. And, um, and so I have Nina, um, who is doing the bulk of the work. And then you have Jay, who is not that much younger than her. Mm -hmm. And I think what is interesting about Jay is that he is somebody who, if this were, um, if Nina didn't exist, he would be the one that has to step up. Mm -hmm. And he's the man of the house. And he, you know, and so he has that sense of like, well, I know what to do better. I know the thing to do. Um, but in fact, Nina is the one that's actually responsible. Nina is the one who, at the end of the day, you know, is going to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And so you have that tension there. And then if, hey, if Judd, if Jay is that way, then HUD has to go the other way. And that just makes, HUD ended up being someone that I just love. I just adore him. And I just, I love him because he's the only one helping Nina out. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have Kit, 
And what I find really fun about Kit is that, and I think this happens in a lot of families, I mean, really in any family, when you have siblings, you grow up in the same house, right? But you don't have the same childhood. Mm -hmm. And so for Kit, by the time she was old enough to understand what was going on, her dad had left. And she already had three older siblings who were taking care of her in some way. So she has different scars than the rest of them. And, uh, and isn't quite as afraid of her father, or he, he doesn't loom as large for her in some ways. And that gives her um, what I think is the most fun thing about Kit, which is like, she'll say the thing that nobody's saying. It's it, as they say, like the family truth teller. Yeah. Um, and so Kit, I mean, I just found different things that I love about all of them, but Kit was, was a lot of fun to write. I bet because you're sitting at the table going, wait a second, guys, you realize what's going on here. It's not yeah. good. <laughs> right. And, and, you know, in a lot of families, there's like, we all know what's happening, but the rule is you don't say it. Right. You know, and she's like, no, no, no. like I'm saying what's happening. Yeah. And, and in a lot of ways you need that person as much as like, again, Nina will never like struggle so much to get to a breaking point. Kit starts from a place of like, no, 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 let's call this out, you know, and you need that, that balance. And so I think they're all really different, but they, but they, um, I don't know. I have, I have a lot of affection for their little, their crew. Yeah. Yeah. And the way they all hang out together, you know, before you were a writer, before you were a writer, uh, you worked in casting yeah. and I'm thinking that the fact that you worked in casting helps you shape character so much because you were basically building characters when you were doing casting, like they're on the page, but until you see the person, it's not that Thank man. You. <laughs> no, I feel the same way. It's so funny because I look at my career and they seem like two very different jobs where it was like, when I was in college, I was saying, I'm going to be a casting director and that's what I want to do. And then I started working in casting and I thought, wait, no, I, I, have, I feel like I want to do something slightly different. And I'm not sure what it is, but in hindsight, it's all the same passion. It's that passion for character. I'm interested in when I'm telling a story, there's, there's what happens and there's how it happens, but there's also who it happens to. And that's the thing that I'm the most interested in. And I have been, that's the aspect of storytelling in any medium that I'm drawn to. And so, I mean, that's what makes it really fun now having some of my work then be adapted is because I get to, to experience all of my different passions at once. Yeah, it's like so-and-so is not available. Oh, but how would so-and-so do in that role? Oh, and what would that be if this, so-and-so couldn't do it? <laughs> this is the stuff I find the most fascinating, the most fun. This, this is like the, the part of Hollywood that I think is like, you know, you know, like some just areas of life, they just give you like that buzz where you're like, I'm just excited about that. Mm -hmm. Casting is one of those for me. Yeah. And right now it's also how much casting has to shift because of the pandemic, because yes. you were booked for such and such and such and such and such and such. But now which one is really happening and will yeah. that conflict? Yeah. And I think that we're, you know, hey, look, the characters on the page, you can just move them around. You could say, hey, yes. girl, boy, boy, girl, but you could do yes. girl, boy, girl, boy. Like you can figure out what you yes. want. I yeah, well, that's the nice thing about writing a book as opposed to making a movie or a TV show is that I have no limits based on reality at all, you know? So it's like, no, no, they live in a super huge mansion in Malibu. It's the greatest. Oh no, they're the biggest seventies rock band of all time. They made the best album ever. Don't worry about it. It's just true. You know, it's, it's the Daisy Jones production that has to go figure out how to make that music. It's, it's the Malibu rising production that has to go figure out how to make that house. And so I get to, uh, I, I really get to have my cake and eat it too. Yeah, and you get to set the bar really high for the next team. That's like, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. that's exactly what's going to happen, yeah. you know? Yeah. Now, there's a moment, speaking of like, you know, making things happen, where the surfing is so visibly described that I thought, yes, I can do that too and hang with the Rivas. <laughs> Forgetting that I can't even manage to get to the beach on a boogie board. Like, yeah. I can't even hold you on. You and I are bar. in the same boat. <laughs> okay. So thanks for that moment, though, because I was feeling really good. I was <laughs> yeah. out on the board, blah, blah, blah. Have you spent any time on a surfboard have you tried it i so i spent about 20 minutes on a surfboard in hawaii when i was writing the book my husband and i had gone on vacation uh and i was like you know i've written this whole book and i've never surfed and that feels like i should probably 
change that. It was so embarrassing. And it was like, I couldn't have been, it couldn't have been more like mild conditions. It's like the guy's going to take me out there. He's going to wait for the slow wave to come. He's going to push me out. And still I'm like, and I just topple over. Um, but it gave me so much respect for, for two things. One, when you are a surfer, you have a relationship with nature that is unlike any other sport. You don't, you know, you are beholden to the ocean mm -hmm. when you are a surfer. You go out when the conditions are good, whether you feel like it right now or not. If you really want to go surfing and the conditions are bad, you cannot go surfing. Um, you have to have a relationship with the ocean, which I think is really incredible. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing too, is just from a muscular point of view, I was like, like my, I, I fell off a surfboard twice and I was like, my abs are hurting, like my core. And, and so it's like, you know, these are real athletes out there. What yeah. having that command of that surfboard takes all the muscles in your body. And so I know a lot of surfers, I interviewed them for the job, for the book and like better that they are doing that than me. I have to admit, though, there's this show right now on HBO. I think it's got a couple of, it actually was just renewed. I just read The 100 Foot Wave, and this man oh. is in quest of seeing. And I am loving this. I like watching the people at Mavericks. I like, yes. especially like when Mavericks, when the wave comes up on the beach and gets all the people that are sitting on the beach, that they have to move that part back. And it's all so unpredictable. It's, mm -hmm. you can go out thinking you're going to catch this and you catch that. And it's, I mean, it's changed since they can get ridden out and, you know, yeah. things like that. I mean, that's yeah. completely changed it, but yeah. And then my friend who lives on the beach at Malibu says that it's yoga on the water. And she jokes that people are in her backyard. <laughs> <laughs> and it's humorous because you see dozens of people looking beautiful sitting oh, yeah. out on the water for hours, just, you know, pretending yeah. the waves are coming. It's, it's a good life. Well, I love the scenes where the Riva kids sat on their boards waiting for a wave in which they call the family shred. I yeah, love this. Family like, shred. Yeah. Who's going to go which way? And I picture them hanging and talking and fighting for the best wave. And it was like their version of sitting at the dinner table or hanging out at the park. Mm -hmm. Did you have a favorite moment with the kids? Like when they were doing something like that? I, I love that. Yeah. I, you know, it's funny. There are sections of the book where you don't like, there are parts where you're like, gosh, I thought this was going to be easy to write and it's really hard, or I didn't anticipate I was going to need this scene, but it actually was really easy. And this, the chapter where the kids first learn how to surf, they find a surfboard on the, on the shoreline. And, you know, it's like, Nina's like, no, it's not our surfboard. We shouldn't use it. And Jay's like, no way. We're taking this thing out. And, and HUD is like, wait, Nina's worried, you know, and Kit's like, I'm little, but let me do it. You know? And like, they all um, bond over this experience of trying and failing and trying again to get on that board and ride it into the shore. And it was just one of those ones. I didn't know I was going to write it. And then you come to this moment and you're like, oh, I think I need this. And it just flowed out of me. It just was such a pleasure to write and such a pleasure to spend time with them mm -hmm. when they're sort of at the formation of who they are. Um, so I really, I still really love that chapter. Yeah. I just love when they go out and do that. And the sandwich, I love that there's the Reva sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, you know, like at the next live event, I think the Reva sandwich has to be shared. You know, it's like, uh, okay, know, what is the Reva sandwich? Yeah. Let's see, Mick, where's that recipe? You know? Yeah. It's funny. So my friend, Natasha, who's a chef, she actually put together a recipe for the sandwich. And I think it's on my, it's on my Instagram, but it's funny because it started out as, you know, what is somebody She's 17 years old, mm -hmm. her, her mom is gone, her dad is gone, she owns a fish shack, uh, you know, the family fish shack, she's got to feed her siblings, what's left in the back of the kitchen she can, you know, throw in a roll. And so it's like a pretty wild thing to put on a sandwich. It's like, you know, it's like clams and shrimp and tartar sauce and, um, but when Natasha made it, I was like, that looks delicious, she really, she really nailed it. So the sandwich might just be good. Sandwich might be good. The sandwich is for book club dining. It's like That's you right. eat the food with it. And here's right. your guys, everything is coming together for you. In case you think <laughs> you're go surfing or you can sit by the beach, yeah. you can do your book club and you can eat the sandwich. So yes. 
But how much fun was it researching the history of Malibu? Because it's got this amazing history of how the whole place came to be. And it's not just a bunch of stars. No, no, it's it's so much more complicated and, and beautiful than that. And, um, you know, I, I personally have like a real obsession with like city planning and like how mm -hmm. cities come to be in Los Angeles in particular is such a place because it's a recent city. Um, and I'm from Massachusetts where, you know, cities are from the 1600s, mm -hmm. you know, and so it's a recent place and it's very much the, the birth of Los Angeles and the various neighborhoods in Los Angeles are really such a sign of, of reinvention. I'm going to come here and I'm going to make something different than what I had back home. And this is the new place. Malibu, because it has that rustic nature. Mm -hmm gives you a sense of of the just expanse of time in a way that the rest of los angeles doesn't you're you when you drive through the santa monica mountains you know okay. that you're driving on this long winding road that is maybe 100 years old maybe um but you're in this mountain range that you know has existed since the dawn of time in, in <laughs> some way and and um and so the history of malibu is really really fascinating and just to to give like a beginning beginning lesson on it, what I find really fascinating is that you know Malibu is surrounded on three sides by mount, by mountain ranges, and the fourth side is the ocean. So until they put in the Pacific Coast Highway, you had to go over the mountains to get to okay. it, mm -hmm. and so it was for a very long time owned by one family, uh, the Frederick and May Ringe. And they owned the area. It's called Malibu because that's like a mispronunciation of, I believe, a Chumash um, word for the area. And so um, they own Malibu over, you know, a few decades. The, um, the government's trying to put in the Pacific Coast Highway, but they have to go through the Ringes property of Malibu in order to do that. The Ringes are really against it. They're trying to launch this lawsuit. It cost them a lot of money. And suddenly now they need to start renting areas of their property to people to make money. And they start renting parcels of the beach in Malibu Colony to movie stars. And that's how you get this, this rustic area with these glamorous movie stars all in the same place. And so you've got like Joan Crawford and Douglas Fairbanks Jr. They have a little spot there, you know, Cary Grant, that's where they go on their weekends when they're away from the movie studio. And so I just, uh, that's just my catnip. I, I love that stuff. I just love it. And I love that it's not that far to be in LA. It's not, no. but this is going to the beach. And yes. my friend did that too. Their family actually had a house in land. They went there on the weekends. That's mm -hmm. what they would go do. And I just yeah. found it was, I don't know. I just think it was so interesting to see how the whole place grows up and gets its pedigree, but not the way you really felt. And I always say to people, if you're going to do anything, it's really just drive that 101 all the way up the coast. I yes. mean, if you can just do that and yes. usually do it North, not going South, because down in Big Sur, that's a little nerve wracking making those turns. You know? I always make my husband drive when we're driving through Big Sur, which Big Sur is also phenomenally beautiful. Talk about like when the ocean meets the mountains and the cliff sides. And I mean, it's so, so beautiful, but yeah, you get those turns and it's like, suddenly you're like, maybe I should only be driving 10 miles an hour. They're, they're pretty intense. I drove up the coast with my sons at one point. I said, we're going to get to the curvy part. And I said, they said, I think we're in it. Yeah. <laughs> I, said, I said, I think we need to stop gas. They go, there is none. <laughs> so yeah. I, okay. Yeah. I guess we just keep rolling on, you know? Yeah. Now, why set the book in the eighties and not now? I mean, I think I've got some of the answers to this. And one I think is to, to avoid social media. <laughs> oh, I mean, I would, I'll always write to avoid social media or a cell phone, honestly. Um, yeah. For me, what was fun about it was two, was two big things. The one was when I finished Daisy Jones, you know, the, the uh, Daisy Jones and the Six ends in 1979. In a lot of the research that I was doing, I was starting, the, the 80s were looming in, you know, it's like the albums that were starting to come out, the TV shows, the, the politics. 
I would find myself being like, oh, I can't mention that or reference that. That's only, that's in a few more years. And so I was drawn to the 80s because of that sense that um, there was there was more, you know, sort of hovering in the distance. Mm -hmm. The other thing is, I wanted to write a really wild knockout party. And when better to throw it than in the decade of excess? When, you know, in the early 80s, we have a period of time in which it's a bubble that has not burst yet. It's this sense that, you know, uh, it's good to be entirely self-motivated. The, the, um, the uh, yuppies are, you know, like, that's a cool thing to be. And uh, preppies and, and all that, you know, the Alex P. Keatons of the world. Um, it's, it's totally fine to be motivated by money and to want more and to want bigger and to do bigger things. And without that sense of reflect, reflection that I'm so glad we have now, which is how are my actions um, mm -hmm. affecting the world around me? And what responsibility do I have to my community? Um, I'm not saying nobody thought of those things in the 80s, but the larger zeitgeist was like, go bigger, you know? And so, yeah, let's throw the wild party then. Um, and then come on, 80s music, don't you? I mean, yeah, of course. Of why course. not? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny because I listen to, I used to listen to audiobooks when I commuted to New York, but now I go like 10 minutes. <laughs> so yeah, I do right. a lot of serious XM uh -huh. and I have it set on the seventies, the eighties and the nineties. And I just click through and I'm just like, now, wait a second. Was this song late seventies or early eighties? Yeah. Do they mm -hmm. have this right? I always wish I could trip mm -hmm. them up. Mm -hmm. But now we must discuss Mick Riva because Mick was in both Seven Husbands and yeah. Daisy Jones. And did you always know you were bringing good old Mick back? You know, it's funny. I didn't always know it, but um, in hindsight, it was the most natural thing because when I wrote The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo, and it, for anyone that's read it, I won't, I, there's no spoilers, but you'll know that that chapter that he is in is a very special chapter. Mm -hmm. It it really lets you know Evelyn's MO, who she is and and sort of the the most quintessential Evelyn moment. Mm -hmm. And um I loved writing him. I loved writing just how much he thought he always had the upper hand. And uh I just thought it was completely delicious um from from a writing perspective. And so I was just intrigued by him. And I, so I finished that book and then I was writing Daisy Jones and I thought, well, I want to loop these together. I want you to understand that Daisy Jones is a rock star in the same world where Evelyn Hugo is, is in the movies. And it, and I had this moment where Daisy's at a party, she's throwing a party at the Chateau. And, um, I was like, well, why don't I put McReeve at that party and let's put him up, you know, let's make sure he's up to no good per usual. And so when I came to, I, I felt really, really passionately from the beginning that I wanted to tell a story about the children of famous people, mm -hmm. because I wanted to tell a story about what that lens feels like when you didn't choose it. Mm -hmm. Evelyn and Daisy, they know what they want and they go after it. Evelyn wants to be a famous movie star. Daisy wants to be a big rock star. She wants everybody to know her name. Nina Riva does not. Mm -hmm. It was chosen for her in a lot of ways. And I wanted to explore what that felt like. But I also wanted to explore what it would feel like if your father was famous, so there's a lens on you, but he wasn't around. So he's just sort of haunting you. You don't know him that well, but somehow he's on this billboard down the street from your house. Mm -hmm. What would that feel like? And so it was like, well, what famous man's gonna leave his kids? Mick Reba, there you go, I've got it. And so it became an opportunity to really dig into who he is, why he's the way he is, and to learn to have some empathy for mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. um, I think he's definitely the, um, the, the opposing force within this book, but I don't think he's entirely a villain. And that mm -hmm. was a really interesting experience or journey to go on of like this, this person that I sort of love to hate. I now need to um, start to understand who he is more deeply. Yeah. And in the book, I love that Mick is Michael Riva. Yeah. And this is what he wanted. He wanted a career touring all over the world, but he always imagined a family waiting for him when he got home. Mm -hmm. But then he blew that. So I think it was really fun writing his backstory and seeing that, you know, he was a guy 
It didn't come from means. This was like how his voice was how he was going to make it. It's yeah. how he was going to get out. And at the beginning, he really loves June. He really yeah. was completely crazy about his wife. He's crazy about his kids. Mm -hmm. But that lore of being famous and that lore of on the road. And once you're on the road being lonely, and what do you do when you're lonely? Well, you don't go back to your room and call your wife. That's yeah. just the way I saw it. And, yeah. and you need you need more, right? Like you're just hungry for more. You have you have this insatiable need for attention, for love, for for approval, from for attraction from any person that you can get it from. So mm -hmm. here's this beautiful woman, and she's so kind and she's so great, and she'll raise your kids and she'll love you forever. And that's really intoxicating. So he's gonna go for that. And then once he has that, well, that's not doing it for him anymore because he already proved to himself he could get that. So now he needs something else to feel bigger. So now it's he's going to sleep with this woman and this woman, and this woman. But now that's not enough. Now he wants to convince this big movie star to fall in love with him. And then he gets that. And then it's like, well, now I'm sick of that. And it's like this, you know, at some point you you have to be able to receive that you have enough. Mm -hmm. And Mick Riva can't do that. And so if you can't do that, you're always going to be jumping from one person to another. And that's what, and that's what he does. But I believe as much as Mick Riva can love a person, he loves June Riva. It's mm -hmm. just that he cannot and has never been able to get out of his own way. Yeah. And June cannot handle at some point the fact that she's sharing. She just can't no, be there. No. She's just not there. But I did not take it personally that it was noted that it was the carols that ruined everything. I mean, that line, <laughs> I have to tell you, you know, Mick, it was you. It had nothing to do with me. It was <laughs> not Carol Fitzgerald. <laughs> I, I saw that line and I was going through this morning and I was going through pages. I folded down and I was like, oh, the carols ruined everything. Yeah, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then there's this moment because I did my homework reading Seven Husbands, mm -hmm. everybody, mm -hmm. that I realized that if, well, let's see if you can follow this. There's this, this funny, I don't know if you ever saw years ago, um, Carrie Fisher's whole yes. thing about her background. You know, yes. is this the short, dark Jewish man is because yes. I married Paul Simon, yeah, blah, 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 blah. It's, it's hysterically funny. And I'm a huge Paul Simon fan, cracked up at this. But then just like that little chart, yeah. I realized that if Mick is Nina Rifa's father, and her one-time stepmother is Evelyn Hugo. That's I mean, exactly like right. really everybody. That's exactly just, right. Like, because of the deep reading that I did. Very good. Chapter. Very so, good. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. So were you having fun with it at the same time or as yeah. I the only one having fun laughing? No, I, I, I mean, come on. This is the stuff that you gotta, you gotta have fun with it. And, and I think that was like the fact that Evelyn Hugo is Nina Riva's stepmother. It was the thing that for me was like, how delightful just how, and also like in what, like they're so different as yes. women. And so, um, it just makes it, it just makes it fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I fought around the pool having a lot of fun reading this this weekend. I really had good, a great time. Good. But I'm glad it was assigned to me by readers. I thought it was very good, you know? But, you know, I've been laughing these last couple of weeks watching J-Lo and Ben, like, oh, running around together. I, mean, I am absolutely cracking up, especially after reading this. Oh, sure. How much yeah. is, like... It's completely like, you know, made up. It's like completely manufactured. Like we get a picture of them as they're going in the restaurant. Like who tipped them off? I and know. years ago, we had an office that was a block away. It actually, Random House is the other way from Universal Records. Mm -hmm. So one day I'm at it lunchtime. There's the security guard I've seen on the street all these years. I have no idea why he's there, right? None. So all of a sudden this car jumps, jumps up on this Jeep, like jumps up on the sidewalk. All these other cars are jumping. All these photographers with long lenses. And I know it's not me. Like, I know this is not other thing. <laughs> all of a sudden, this Maybach pulls up. And these two people come out. And it's Kim Kardashian. And, you know, like, wow. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, my gosh. Like, where am I? Yeah. And I said to the guy later, like, I've seen her for like 10 years on the street. Yeah. What is your job? He goes, to make sure nobody gets in when that stuff happens. Like, the photographers can't yeah. follow them in. Yeah. I, I was like. This is really what we're like, but I have to admit, like I read page six, like it's news. Like I sit there and read this right. stuff, like, like it matters. And do you read the gossip columns like me with a little bit of a jaded eye, but a little bit of, oh, yes. let's see what happened today. Well, I don't even think it's a jaded eye. I think what's so fascinating and, and JLo and, and Ben Affleck are a perfect example of this. We don't know the truth, right? Like we're, we're never, we're not privy to it. It's none of our business but we're certainly being sold something. 
So maybe they've fallen back in love. Maybe they were always meant to be. Those things are very intoxicating. Maybe they are in love, but they know that it's good for press and they're doing it on purpose. Maybe, you know, there's a thousand different ways that it could go. But what's fascinating to me is immediately just asking yourself, why? Mm -hmm. Who is it good for? Who does it benefit? Mm -hmm. It's looking at things with a critical eye, which to be honest, is something that's so easy and fun to hone within the world of gossip, mm -hmm. but then becomes quite helpful later when you're reading any type of news. Mm -hmm. I'm being given this information. That's the only thing that I know for sure. Mm -hmm. Who does it benefit? Who's telling me? Why would some, why does someone want me to know this? Uh, do I believe it's true? You know? And so you look at it, something like Jane and Ben, and it's like, okay, you're on a yacht, you know, in Saint Tropez, the cameras are on you. You can tell what are you trying to show me and why? And you don't necessarily get an answer, but boy, is it a fun mental exercise. And it's you really know? been more fun when you realize Alex Rodriguez is on a boat like three yachts, three well, hours. I mean, out. what is he trying to do? And why does he think that's going to work? You know, it's all just really, really fun. And I think what, what I do think there's a skill there that you can hone that because we're used to just, oh, if you see the picture, then it's true. You see right. the picture, then it's true. You know, oh, you know, page six is, is, has an inside source saying this. And there are a lot of websites. One that I really love reading and I read every day, uh, every weekday is Laney Gossip. And what Laney's really good at is, you know, saying, well, this TMZ we know has a long history with this celebrity. So when you get an unnamed source on something, it's probably from this person. Mm -hmm. Whereas this other person in the divorce has a better relationship with this site, you know, and it's like you, you start to just look at things with a more critical eye in a really fun way. Yeah. It's like, why do you need to do this at this point in your career? Let's make the, let's, you know, figure out the ways let's figure exactly. out why you're doing this today. You know, exactly. it's not just yeah. to be nice. It's really yeah. nice. Yeah. It's like what I saw in all three books. It's the other side of fame. It's like you're mm -hmm. seeing the other side. You're seeing them in the, but this is, this is who they are when they go home. Yes. This is what happens to Mick when he shows up on the beach. Like this is right. what happens to all these people. Right. Is that what, that, so I am on the right track. I feel yeah. like, you know. Yeah. I mean, what I'm, what I'm trying to do is, is, I mean, it's storytelling, right? So it's, and, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to tell you two stories at once. I'm trying to tell you what the legend is what the famous person, what story they're selling. And then I'm also trying to tell you alongside of that, what the truth is mm -hmm. and how the tension exists between those two stories. Evelyn Hugo is selling the public a very specific story that works and it's tried and it's true. And she knows that she could use that story to get up to the top. It is not the true story of who she is. She is unable to tell the true story of who she is because she lives in a homophobic, racist, xenophobic, you know, misogynist world, right? Mm -hmm. So she's going to use that world against itself and sell everybody a story that they want to buy. Mm -hmm. That is stuff I find really, really fascinating. But, and that's the most like potent example of it. Mm -hmm. But Daisy Jones is doing the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. The world is believing, oh, look at this happy band. Maybe there's something going on between them. Meanwhile, Daisy Jones is completely heartbroken mm -hmm. those two stories are not the same but they exist alongside each other and with nina it's like who wouldn't want to be mcreva's kid you must have so much money you are famous from the day that you're born you're so beautiful you're a supermodel you're married to a tennis star everything must be so great gosh i wish i was nina reva and it's like well here's what nina reva's day looks like here's what it costs her to keep this going is it worth it mm -hmm. and you can understand why at some point she might want to break it all down yeah. And I just feel like it's these days of social media, everybody wants to be drawn to fame like they're stars. I mean, the yeah. things that people are doing, it's yeah. crazy. I mean, to sit there and watch, I mean, besides just like nutty stuff. And I feel like using the 80s would be very different than writing something set today because now everyone is trying to be a star. Everybody is trying to, yeah. fall, you know, figure out what's going on. Well, so. and we also, we live in a bit more cynical of a time because we're aware of some of these machinations more. We're aware of, um, what fame can get you and how you can use it and leverage it for things that you want. And, and so, um, it's not, 
it's just not as fun to write about right now for me. One, I don't have the distance from it, yeah. but also, um, you know, people don't get famous by accident anymore. You don't have the like Johnny Depp was in a band and then somebody said, well, you should be in this movie. And he was like, I don't want to be in a movie, you know, <laughs> and and because he's a cool rock star, you know, but it's like, we'll just be in this one movie. You know, it's like you don't get that anymore. And again, that's a story that's being peddled. I don't know what the truth is, but you just don't have that origin story as much. You don't have Lana Turner was sitting in a diner and, and you know, on a break from high school and a movie producer saw her and said, you got to be in movies. You know, you don't get that anymore. You get mm -hmm. like, she was on TikTok. She had this many followers. They're going to give her a movie, you know, and that's fine, but it's just less fun to write about. Yeah, totally less fun. But speaking of TikTok, did I read that one of the reasons Evelyn Hugo was back on the New York Times list is because of a TikTok video? I, I didn't get a chance to trace that down, but I'm like dying to yeah. see that, you know? Um, truly one of the coolest things has happened to me in my career, especially because when it first popped onto the New York Times list after that many years after coming, coming out, you know, it had been selling well, but it just started to really skyrocket. And, you know, my whole team were scratching our heads like, and we're not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. This is fantastic. But why? Why now? And then I remember getting a call from my manager and he was like, do you know what book talk is? And I was like, yeah, I know what book talk is. But but for me, I really try not to find myself on the Internet mm -hmm. and with TikTok in general. If you start looking at something enough times, it's going to start sending them to you. And I knew, like, if I look up myself and see if people are talking about my book on TikTok, it's going to show me myself, and I don't want it. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know that people were talking about it on on Book Talk. And suddenly, you know, it was like he figured it out, and then like Random House figured it out, and then Simon Schuster figured it out. And suddenly, it's like, oh, it's TikTok. And I can't tell you, I'm I'm psyched about it for two reasons. One, it means more people are reading the book, and I love it. And two a lot of the people that are talking about the book on TikTok are young women. Yeah. And it's really, really exciting to me to get to share that book that says so much about how I see the world and things that are important to me and speaks to issues that were, were important to me to make, to see what I could do to make certain women feel less alone. Mm -hmm. So it makes me very, very happy that that book is getting into the hands of young women who might feel you know emboldened to be who they truly are by reading that book it it delights me to no end i love it and you are dead right about whatever you look at on tiktok somehow oh, yeah somehow it is i capable. watch gender reveals do not ask me why okay? <laughs> i do not have kids that are having kids forever and now every time i log on there I get gender reveals and I think reels is giving me the same thing. And I'm like, yep. why? I mean, I don't even think these things are a good idea. I just don't I get it. You yeah. look at it one time. That's <laughs> yeah. how they get you. Like sometimes stuff will come through and I'll be like morbidly curious, but I'm like, nope, can't do it. Cause if I, if I watch the whole thing through, you're just going to send me more of that. And I have to be careful. I must be very, yeah, believe me, <laughs> I've learned my lesson. I've really learned my lesson. I need like a new name to go on TikTok, yeah. you know? Yeah. You know, fame is a crazy thing. My uncle was actually one of the original four seasons in the early 60s. He was one I, of the original yes. four. And he was actually the first one to leave. And it's very interesting to see how many of the stories that are told about that mm -hmm. don't quite match up. Like it yeah. doesn't all yeah. come to like the show and everything. Yeah. And it's like, ah, oh, celebrity. And I think I saw that at a really young age because mm -hmm. I was very young when this whole thing was going on. I mean, I'm only 27 now. So you yeah. can just imagine you what I was in the 60s. don't even look it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine what I was in the 60s, you know? <laughs> but it was just really, it was, it's a very interesting to have watched it on a personal level and have seen what people know and what they don't yeah. know and what they make up. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it's always crazy. So now we're at this party that we always yeah. know this party is going to happen. The publisher has already told us it's not going to end yeah. well. Yeah. It also made me feel like, why was I not invited? Because everybody who's <laughs> like, you, you don't get invited. Anybody just, who's anybody. Yeah. You just hear about it. You just hear yeah. about it. So you set it up and start. Was the party there for you right, right at the beginning going, that's mm -hmm. how this thing's going to end. It's going to be this blowout, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I, I really wanted it to be, let's. Put the, let's push this family to a breaking point by bringing everybody into their house and let every problem they've had 
you know, just rise and rise and rise until suddenly, you know, things can't continue on the way that they are. And so I just thought, let's make this as wild of a party as possible. Let's bring in the craziest famous people I can think of, you know, and just have a lot of fun with it. And I really wanted it to be an immersive experience of the party. I didn't want it to feel like you were reading about a party. I wanted it to feel like you were at a party, mm -hmm. that, that you felt like you were a fly on the wall. You're the wallflower hanging back while you're watching all this craziness happen. Because, you know, look, I, I put a lot of how I feel about the world into my books and I talk about things that are very important to me and I'm always writing from a place of, you know, uh, who are the people in the world that I want to lend support to? Who, what do I want to criticize? You know, but I also just want you to have a really good time. I want you to be able to open up the book and just have a blast. And so I thought, let me take you to an 80s beach bash in Malibu and just let you watch it all unfold. Yeah. And it all goes absolutely crazy. So I noticed something that the book took place on August 27th, 1983. And I feel like something fun should happen for fans this year because Friday is August 27th this year. So I think in a tribute to the Rivas, I'm sure I'm not cool enough, but I feel like, you know, Taylor Jenkins reads fans. We've got to get together and we've got to do something. There's got to be parties every place celebrating this book on August 27th. I mean, I hope that you agree with me. That is such a good idea. And I did not even think of that. I'm literally writing it down in my to-do list now, August 27th, let's do something. That is such a smart. It's smart. Friday, August 27th. Yeah. I mean, yeah, next year, I mean, we could flip it and we could do it on a Saturday night. I mean, yeah. it's like really fine. We're not in one of those, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, on a sort of serious note, though, towards the end of the book, there's one of my favorite lines and it's really long. So I folded this down and I went back last night because it was going down like what matters to me when I'm reading the book. And then mm -hmm. I like to go back later and say everything I know now and taken a couple of weeks yeah. since I've read the book, actually here a couple months, like, what do I think? So this is what I folded down and it's long, but here you go. June, who's um, Nina's mother, had given her a box packed to the brim with her own experiences, her own treasures and heartbreaks, her own guilt, pleasures, triumphs and losses, values and biases, duties and sorrows. Nina had been carrying around this box her whole life, feeling the whole weight of it. But it was not Nina, it, this, but it was uh, not Nina just saw just then, her job to carry the full box. Her job was to sort out the box, decide what? of the things she inherited to bring forward and what of the past she wanted to leave behind. Did you have that line early and write to it or did that come towards the end? That was at the very, very end, multiple, multiple drafts. And I felt like I just wasn't nailing this feeling that I wanted to give that we have to be active in choosing what generational patterns to continue and what to leave behind mm -hmm. that it, it won't happen passively if we're passive about it we will repeat the mistakes of the people before us or go so far out of our way to do it that that we end up somehow creating the thing we were trying to avoid mm -hmm. i hadn't i just hadn't nailed it and i actually remember i was working on the book i was getting toward the end around that passage i just wasn't i couldn't get it I was like, I need to put this down and go do something else. So I went and I took a shower and I'm in the shower and I heard that like pretty much as it is written, I heard it and I, I heard it and I thought that's it. That's what I want to write. And I didn't have pen or paper or anything. And I knew I'd done this enough times that I knew I would forget it. So I wrote the entire passage in the condensation on the shower door. <laughs> and then got out of the shower uh went and got my camera took a picture of it and typed it because i just i i had been looking for that paragraph the whole time and it just sometimes it comes to you when you're not in front of your computer mm -hmm. usually it does yeah usually it does and that's the reason the best thing about the phone is I send yeah. more drafts to myself. Like people say, how do you write a newsletter every Friday night? I said, I write it all week. If something yeah. happens, I yeah, say, just a little something. Remember yeah. this, or you're never gonna be able to do that. There's yeah. so much in that line. Um, I want to say hello, book clubs. Like, just take that and go back and look at the whole book under the frame of that, of what's going on. And then look at the rest of these books, like look at what's going on. So 
I love that you set this book around the 24 hour time period and then filling in the backstory. And because we know it's happening at one o'clock and we, it's, it's like, we're counting down to the fire. I mean, yeah, we know yeah. there's going to be a fire. Nobody yeah. else does. Was it fun doing that kind of pacing? Like, you know, you're going to, yeah. Yeah. It was. It gave such a firm structure to it that it made it nice because I understood, like, we're keeping the story going. We're moving at all times. Even if we're in a flashback, you understand that, like, the day is progressing. We're getting closer and closer to the party starting. And then it, it, it also allowed for a sort of dual, dual structure, which is the first half of the day, um you're you're learning about how the Riva kids go about their day and then you're also learning about the past and then once you get to the party you're learning about everything that's at the party including some of these party guests and so it allowed me to play it's almost like you put in a firm structure so that then you can play within it and so uh it was a fun way to write a book for sure it was interesting because this and the paper palace which is another one of my favorite books this summer does the mm -hmm. same thing it's set over 24 hours and 50 years and mm -hmm. I like the yeah. structure of the two books and what you're both doing is you're telling this one thing, but it's framed, it's framing everything else. Exactly. It's everything else yeah. That's going on. yeah. So how do you work with your editor? I think it's Kara. Is Kara your editor? Or uh, no, it? Jennifer Hershey is my editor. Yeah. How yeah. do you work with those two? Like, when does she see this book? Does she see it early? Does she see yeah. draft or she sees? Yeah. In, in general, I write about four drafts on my own of something. I do the first and second. And by the end of the second is really when it's the book that I meant to write. And then it's, I, I edit it one more time. I send it to my husband who reads it and gives me his notes. And then I send it to Jennifer. That's typically how it works. Um, and you know, this book took a lot of edits. It, I was really, I had bitten off a lot and I needed really a lot of help trying to figure out how to chew it. Like, um, so I think Jennifer and I did about three more drafts, mm -hmm. um, maybe even four. Um, but Jennifer's just been incredible. Uh, she's a real, I mean, she's phenomenally talented as an editor, but what's also just lovely about her is I think she really understands how these books, um, also are a part of my growth as a person. And so mm -hmm. she's really very thoughtful about helping me to become a better writer with each book and understanding thematically, you know, what I'm writing about and, and how it, it um, ties into the things that I'm thinking about in my own life. You know, Malibu Rising is very much, as we were just talking about um, with that paragraph, it's about what parents owe to their children and what children owe their parents. And that's a thing I, I started thinking about in a new way after becoming a mom. And mm -hmm. so, you know, there is no Malibu rising without me having my daughter. And so Jennifer has been really, really helpful in just helping me grow in all in all ways. Mm -hmm. And there also comes a moment where you change your relationship with your parents. Yeah. After you're a parent, your relationship, and you also see things even at my stage of life that you want to do differently. You just want to do differently in relationship with parents, children, and whatever. And there's time. It's not like you have to continue on those same paths. It's like, what are no. we going to do? Let's just shake it all up. And a lot of people stay in those traditional roles or whatever. And instead, it's like, it can be a little bit more worse than all these days. It doesn't yeah. all have to be perfect, you know? And, and like, don't be afraid to change, right? Like, it's never too late to change something and to ask yourself, is something working? or not working, or did I think it was working, but maybe it's not working. And I think that's a lot of, you know, in, in Malibu Rising, it's a question of there are great, there can be great things that your parents did that you want to do for your kids. And there can be things that you can say, you know what, this is a burden, or this was a pain, or this was, this comes from a place of trauma, or this didn't help me, and I'm going to put it down. Mm -hmm. And then someday your children will do that. No, <laughs> yeah, well, but, but right in theory, they're going to do that with the things that you've given them. And, exactly. and, and my hope, and look, my kid's five now, so I talk a big game, but like, I'm not actually facing these things. But like, my hope is that by the time my daughter's going through that, that I've sorted through mine enough that I can receive like, okay, I understand why you're not going to do this, why you're going to put this one down. Mm -hmm. And I feel really touch that you're going to carry that forward yeah that that goes this stays it's all cool it's yeah. all cool yeah so julia whalen not narrates the audiobook and i saw the two of you do an interview like way mm -hmm. back at the beginning yeah, yeah. start the tour i take it you selected her to narrate i take yeah. it that you you selected and it's I, like every on. time every book the it's it's so funny because she's so good at her job and she's so in high demand that i'm always like julia 
you don't have to do this one if you're too busy, but I, you are my first choice. And every time she comes through and mm -hmm. I'm just so, so fortunate because she's just such a, there are a lot of amazing audio book narrators right now. We have just a, a an embarrassment of riches, mm -hmm. but Julia is, is my person. And so yeah. it's been, I yeah love that, that I get that gift of her. I tell you, the two of you look a lot alike on screen too. Do we? Well, that, you know, I don't, that's very flattering because I've told Julia many times, I've been like, I don't want to objectify you, but you are one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen. Like, I just am so enchanted by her too. That night I was sitting there, I'm like, wait a second, wait, which one, which I was really doing that. So just know I was doing that. And I was like, wait, 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 which one's Taylor? If the names are on the bottom, I've been like totally mixed up. So was the title of this book always Malibu Rising? Was this always no. what it was going to be? No, it was Malibu Burning from its inception. I, you know, I, I pitched it as Malibu Burning and it was Malibu Burning pretty much until I think like the week before we announced the book. But when Malibu caught fire in 2018, I started to get nervous that it that the title might be insensitive to the people that were living had had lived through that fire. And we were all on the fence about it because it was not the title wasn't meant to be insensitive. It wasn't um cheeky or anything like that. Um so we we kept feeling like no, people will know we don't mean it in a in an insensitive way. But Malibu caught fire again. Mm -hmm. the week before I think we were going to announce the book was coming out and I just felt like it's not worth it to me to to risk people feeling it's insensitive to anything they're going through mm -hmm. and it's funny because changing it to Malibu Rising ended up becoming this um really fortuitous thing because you know as we've talked about the themes of the book are this idea that that things burn down and then something rises from the ashes. Mm -hmm. And so Malibu burning and Malibu rising, they're just two ends of the same metaphor. Mm -hmm. And Malibu rising gives that sense of hope that Malibu burning didn't quite have. And so I'm really, I'm really happy we changed the title. Yeah. And it's, it's, you think about the kids rising up out of their lives. Think of like, yeah. you know, what's you know yeah. going on. Yeah. So this cover besides, um, okay, this is my favorite color. Let's get, we're all here folks. Yeah. <laughs> but besides that, great cover yeah, i mean i just saw this job. was this something you played around a lot to get to this cover or was this like cover we, first we had a lot of covers come through and to be honest when you're dealing with like surfers and ocean they're all beautiful which was you know i was like i'll take any of these and i'm happy but but prh was really really serious about getting the perfect cover and mm -hmm. so they came up with this one and you know we fiddled around with the font and done it's just yeah. you know it's just a simple beautiful cover it's simple beautiful. Happy. the name calls out your name calls out and you see yeah. the four and it yeah. was i don't know I, I just think it's um i think it's the iconic summer cover let's start there and I then will, go from there i yeah. love it yes so I know Daisy Jones and Six has been optioned by Hulu. It's been cast and you have a script. Are they shooting yet? Or is this in like COVID? Let's figure out who does what to who yeah. these days. Yeah. You know? So yeah. So Daisy Jones is at Amazon. It should start Amazon, shooting okay. this fall. Um, it should start shooting this fall. It was supposed to shoot last year. Obviously COVID ruins everything. Um, but but um, everybody's gearing up to start shooting very soon, which I'm very, very excited about. Now, I remember you and I were talking at a media lunch way back from Daisy Jones yeah. was coming out. And I remember we were thinking about the lyrics and we yes. were thinking yes. Grammy. And we were thinking, <laughs> what would yeah. you, this is, okay, fine, folks, this is how far we go with like thinking <laughs> fame. It was not just, she'd written these and they're in the back of the book. Okay. Right. No. We take it one step further. It's, <laughs> the songs are being written and because she's the lyricist, she will be winning the Grammy for this. And we were discussing what she'd be wearing. Okay. Yeah, so yeah. I mean, all all of all. Yeah. I mean, what's really actually unforeseen and really exciting is that they've got this amazing music team on the show. They've made really great music and they've written new lyrics. So we're get, you're gonna get like the songs, the song titles. Like there's you're gonna have like, you know, regret me. Like you'll have one of those. Um, but it's it's a it's a different version of it but they're all just very very good they're very good songs i've heard early stuff it was very early but like i was listening to it and i was like 
oh my God, this is it. This is the band. This is Daisy Jones and the Six. And I'm like, I'm very excited for people to hear it. It's very good music. If the Grammy happens, they must point you in the audience as their muse. Yes. There we go. This is the woman who gave us the words <laughs> that inspired the song. Like yeah. the, the, the lyrics that inspired the lyrics that we wrote is this woman, yeah. you know? Has anybody else been optioned and announced that I missed or like is- Well, your hush -hush? Mal Malibu Rising is at Hulu. Um, that's, Evelyn that's Hugo is, okay. is in development. I can't, I can only be vague about it. And then, and then, yeah, I've got some other stuff cooking. We'll see. We'll see. But for right now, the big things are Daisy Jones and, and Malibu rising. Those are the, the big ones at the moment. I'm trying to think of like, you know, who could act in this because, you oh, know, well, please send me a list. I send you a list. You know, yeah. 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 So now you've done books that are set in the sixties, the seventies and the eighties. Yeah. Nineties yeah. next, or are we like making this up? Nineties is next. 90s is switch next. the radio station on Sirius and get the music. Yeah. Okay, right. <laughs> yeah, sure I yeah. yeah. I, I've, I'm, I've made a big deep dive into the '90s. Um, I'm excited to be able to talk to to everybody about what it is soon, but but not quite yet. But it's, um, I'm really really uh, taken with it at the moment. I'm, I'm really loving it. I mean, I'm in the part of the cycle where you love it instead of the part where you think your career is over. But you know, both. I spend time in both places equally. Um, but I'm just really proud of it. Set in the 90s about a famous woman. I think it's going to be the last of this sort of quartet of books about famous women, you know, women living in the public eye and, and wrestling with that image versus who they truly are. And then we'll get too close to you who are famous. You know, we'll get too close to your timing. You know what I mean? It's like we're getting close. We're getting close. You know, it's funny because uh, Linwood Barkley's got this great line when he says, when he sends the, waits for notes from the, um, it was his, his um, editor. Mm -hmm. He said, it's sort of like waiting for tests from the doctor. Yes. <laughs> says, yes. Like, Am I going to live? Am I going yeah. to die? Is the book going to yeah. live? Is the book going to die? Yeah. So, yeah, we look, <laughs> that's we look forward good. to seeing what's next. Two years, do you think? Two years? Yeah, next? I think so. Yeah, yeah. So this is such a pleasure. You've given me so such fun. joy with all three. Thank you. And, and everybody, I suggest, really, if you've read this, go back and read this. And then read Daisy Jones. Like, if you haven't done them, because you're going to see where the little breadcrumbs are dropped. And I think that it's fun when you can take a series like that. It's not a series, but take a group of books like that and see what the author was trying to do. Yeah, you can read them in any order, but each one relates to the other. Yes, yeah. and I did this one last and it was supposed to be first, but TikTok <laughs> didn't tell me in time. You know, it's on the gender reveals. You know, what can I say? So, Taylor, it's always a pleasure. I hope next time Thank in person. You so much. I know, same. It was so lovely to see you. Great. And to everybody right. else, look forward to seeing you next time on Book Reporter Talks 2.